Alrighty, good morning everybody. Good morning, mountain goats. Eh? We've been going up and down these lovely mountains. Yesterday I went up uh, um, Mount Wellington, that is high. If you happen to go there, long pants, not just for casinos, a um, couple of jumpers. Recommend it. It is freaking cold. <laughs> this was around sunset, but <laughs> I had a jumper. I wish I'd taken it. What? Yes. My deepest respect for the people who were discussing cycling up there. And actually, well, the ones that actually go and do it. That, that is really quite, a, quite an endeavor. Hmm? Yes, I'll believe it. Yes, I was here in April a couple of years back and they said there was snow up there at the, at the time. But it, it's the most amazing view. Do go up there. It is fantastic. It is really, really good. You have no idea. Um, well, I have some photos I can show you later, but anyway. So, um, we'll talk about um, our Delta now. Um, so, our Delta is a, a group of people, a project, and we build for MySQL. Not just regular builds, because that's already done, obviously. We add some stuff, and then we put it in a neat package. Not just a tarball, because a tarball is not a product. Um, it's done into neat Debian and CentOS Red Hat packages at the moment, and there'll be other packages coming. Um, we'll get to SUSE, we'll get to Windows even, um, but give us time, and it depends a bit on, on demand. At the moment, it's mainly aimed at um, either developers or people who are deploying with specific problems. Um, and I'll discuss that in a moment. I'll, in this talk, I'll talk mainly about our Delta as a project and not about the specific features um, <coughs> because there's another talk on that tomorrow. So this is more about how we actually stuck together the project and why we're, um, why we're doing this particular um, thing. Um, now you may see some things blinking in the corner. I'll have to ignore those. Um, I hope that nothing actually pops up. I'll, I'll stop that one. Um, and I will shut that one up. That would be nice. Yeah, that would work. The rough version would be quit. Thank you. Yes, yes. I am sure I want to quit. What's that? Yeah. No, I usually... Um, don't run those things while doing something else. Yes, and Mac OS 10 and so on, I agree. Um, however, I have this thing. So, our Delta. So, for a long time, we've had the problem where there's stable MySQL versions that have been out for a while, and builds happen every, every so many months from MySQL. That hasn't been entirely predictable in the past. In theory, the community edition should be released twice a year. Um, but that, that story has been a bit stretched up to the point where at some point a new release was built that basically only contained a security fix. And that was then one of those releases. Um, things have recently improved, but that's only one release. So I don't know <laughs> if that's going to go forward. Um, the point is there are fixes being made, both by people at MySQL as well as outside, fixes and enhancements and they don't necessarily find their way into a production version anytime soon. It's all wonderful to play around with version 6 of MySQL, but you're probably not going to use it in production. So the, the reason of existence of our Delta is that um, we need to deal with the real world now, and I don't care what might be on the product roadmap for next year. It's all wonderful and interesting, but that's not the topic of what I'm trying to deal with for me and my customers. So that's the reason um, for our Delta. Um, so first of all, to be very clear, Drizzle is a MySQL fork. Our Delta is not. Um, and the best description has been um, done by uh, James Purser, I think. He calls our Delta a distribution of MySQL. So similar to Red Hat and Ubuntu being distros of Linux, you can regard our Delta as a distro of MySQL. Stuff gets added, stuff gets neat, neatly packaged, and that's, that's what gets done. The objective is not to fork it. That's way too much work. Why would we? Um, MySQL does, does fine work on its end. There's just extra stuff that needs to be done. Um, I will give you an idea of what kind of um, things we're, we're dealing with. 
Um, no, that's the project, and I'll get to that. There's the patches. So, what kind of things do we do we actually put into the R Delta builds? First of all, I've always regarded this as a nuisance that most of your system gets tracked through the syslog interface, but for MySQL you need to check the MySQL error log. That becomes particularly annoying when you're actually trying to track down startup problems, but just general errors in operation. Um, with my ISM you can get corrupted tables potentially and it would get logged there rather than somewhere else. Um, Debian long time ago made a patch for that, so anyone running a Debian derivative will always have looked at, at syslog anyway. Um, that port has been extracted from the bigger amount of changes that Debian made to the startup scripts, and it's in this build. This was done by, by Percona. Um, so the error log essentially no longer exists normally. It just goes into syslog, and I find that rather useful. It's a tiny, it's a tiny little tweak, but it's, um, it's handy. Um, show patches was done by Jeremy Cole, and it is basically a bit of framework to see what else is going on. Um, I should have a an Delta one running. So this is Ubuntu inside Mac and all complicated. Um, and this will look terrible, but you will, I'll actually do backslash G to show it vertical and it'll give you an idea. Um, so for each patch that we apply, there's a little patch info file. And at build time, that gets gathered by a little Perl script or bash script, I didn't even know. And, um, and put into this information. So when you do show patches, you actually get a list of all the patches that have been applied into this particular build. So you can see whether that particular version of that patch actually solves what you're, what you're trying to solve, or you can see which, which particular changes are present in your, um, in your build. What I'll also show is select version, how our delta identifies itself. So it's a normal MySQL version, and then dash D7, um, Delta 7, so that's the, the revision 7 of that patch set of MySQL 5067. Um, we won't do any more 67s probably. Uh, the current version in, in Community Edition, I believe, is now 75. Um, so 5075 will be the seven, next one. Um, but we'll just keep going up in the patch set for 50. For 5.1, we have a different um, we have a different counter. But it may still go up compared to this, just to not confuse uh, people. Um, then dash R delta, so you actually know which build you're dealing with. There's an R delta and an R delta dash sale. The dash sale um, is basically the bleeding edge thing. So there might be patches in there that eat kittens and that kind of stuff. Who knows? It is equivalent to what Percona does with their high performance edition. Um, they essentially only utilize that when someone tries to fix a problem. Um, that they really, really, really must fix for their production system, otherwise they won't be in business tomorrow. That kind of, that kind of case. As in, it's bleeding edge, it'll probably work. It might break things, but it's worse than not fixing the problem in this particular case. Um, in case of our Delta, more things will go in there, and that is, that is the playground, essentially. The only way to get patches tested is getting them out in the real world, and the only way to get them tested easily is to at least put out builds with them. You don't have to use them, but that's the way you can find them. Um, so this one is in our delta dash sale. The 44 <coughs> is directly derived from the bazaar um, revision number of the bazaar tree that was used to build this. So it's not the MySQL bazaar tree. It is the our delta bazaar tree. The our delta bazaar tree doesn't actually contain the MySQL source code. It contains patches and it contains the entire build environment. So it contains all the scripts mainly written by Cafuego, Peter Lieverdink there, um, to put together the whole build. So it, it contains the logic to actually add all the patches to a, to a system and, um, and assemble a source tarball from that. And then um, we use that on all the different platforms to actually build RPMs and Debian packages. And that information for the RPMs and Debs is also based in that, um, in that bazaar tree. Yes, Monty. What, the number? Yeah, it doesn't always go up. Okay. Have a better idea? Oh, just, just as a warning, the, the rev ID is a, is a, um, is a, 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 a thing. So depending on how you merge, you know, the rev ID is back and forth. You can find the, 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 the,
Okay. That would break things. Bugger. Well, yes, let's you and <laughs> Peter discuss that. Yeah, the idea is that this number will only go up, and the other idea would be that, well, preferably, but at least it should be unique, and the uniqueness would have the possible effect that if you have 5067 and you grab revision 44 of the trunk of the I-delta tree, you will be able to recreate the exact same stuff. So if you actually want to make a change compared to the tarball that we did, that is the way to do it. Right. So we're trying to make the process predictable and repeatable. Yes. That's the trick. Yeah. So if what you're saying affects that, then we have a bug to fix. It may affect that. Yeah. Okay. So yes. It's a learning process. This is already revision two of that idea. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might get to way three of doing it. Um, so one thing we've already done, the first build uh, for our Delta, we actually were patching inside the build system of each uh, platform. So we were patching, this is what Percona was doing. Per Percona patches inside the RPM spec file, for instance. So for Debian, you actually need to tweak the Debian list of patches and actually add in all the other patches that you want to add in. It's a very tweakish process. Um, it also becomes highly unreliable and non-repeatable and very messy. So we've changed that. So what we do now is we patch it in one spot create a new source tarball and feed that into the system on each platform. So we've already learned there. Um, while the one might be nicer in theory, it's completely unworkable, particularly as the number of platforms um, increases. And we do make 32-bit and 64-bit builds as well. So at the moment, there's already 20 builds. There's essentially five platforms, 32 and 64-bit, and then regular and sale. So when we add SUSE Linux, we'll have four platforms again. And so on. It, it, it goes really, really quickly. So we don't want to have a lot of manual stuff because the more manual stuff you have, the more you break. So we work out what needs to be done. Um, Peter automates it. Um, it's called auto bake and tar bake and things like that. There's a little bakery subdirectory in the R Delta tree and that solves our problem um, from that perspective. <coughs> so that's the, uh, the versioning. I'll give you an idea about what kind of um, stuff we stick in there. Um, some of it you may regard as slightly indulgent, but most things are just really, really, really useful. Um, but it depends on your exact use case. I'll, I'll give you an overview, and then tomorrow we'll, we'll actually look at that in detail. So we've done the show patches, extended statistics in slow log. Um, you can actually get information that you would normally otherwise only get from either doing an explain, and that only works on select, as you know, as I hope you know, um, as in where index is used in, um, in actually resolving this query. You can kind of deduce that in the slow log by the fact that if you normally um, log items that take longer than a couple of seconds, if you see that the number of seconds taken is zero, but it's in the slow log, then it must have not used an index. Well, that's all wonderful, but it's a bit quirky and you actually need to use brain power to read it. So to actually read it more easily, that's changed. Um, in fact, one of the changes is also not all table scans, so not using an index, are bad. But in the MySQL sense, not, if any query not using an index will get logged if you actually set that flag in the configuration file. So what? What's that? Like so. Um, for instance, um, yeah. So to get rid of that, there's actually a threshold um, in this particular patch. It's modified so that it only gets logged if more than so many rows get accessed. Um, the other reason for that is that a really small table will never use an index. If you have a row that kind of connects a couple of other tables and you only, or list of categories and you only have 10 or 20 rows in it or even 100, it may, MySQL Server may actually always do a table scan because it regards it as faster than looking up in an index. Um, but you don't want that junk in your slow log because it just hinders you from other stuff. You can filter it out, of course, with lots of fancy foo, but um, having the server do it for you is kind of more useful. It also does this on the microsecond um, level. So you can do sub-second um, queries. Now, I'm not actually encouraging you to go down to your microseconds, 
but you have to get some kind of granularity in microseconds is what it, what it turned out to be. Um, but it is often relevant to look at queries that take shorter than a second, but still take a significant amount of time when you look at the grand scheme of how your, how your production system works. So it does that as well. Um, but it also tells, which normally you can, again, derive with knowledge of, for instance, show status. You can tell whether, um, well, first of all, indexes, we've mentioned that, whether a temporary table was used for that particular query. And if that temporary table was in memory or on disk. Same stuff with the sort operation, whether the sort operation was fully in memory or whether it was a file sort that was actually on, on disk. Normally, you can only work that out by looking at explain and looking at the show status just after you've run the query, but you would have had to run status before the query as well because it, it keeps, uh, it's cumulative. Um, so there's a lot of extra stuff that you would otherwise need to do. You now get it for free. It's just part of the extra information. Um, there's information for InnoDB as well. Some extra information internally is what InnoDB decided to do with the particular query. I found that extremely useful. Um, so that's an example of instrumentation that, well, Percona, they, they worked on this and, and, um, and I've done some, some uh, fixing. Um, I find it really useful to use these tools when dealing with customers. And of course, I prefer my clients to all run these builds. Not all of them do, that's entirely their choice, but it makes things easier to track down if they do. So either I'm spending a little bit more time decoding what I see, and of course you can script some of that, but not all, so it takes a little bit more time, or you run this and you actually get a better insight. And in particular, if you're, I mean, this is what I do for a living. I either teach it or I, I muck around in people's configuration. Um, so I can kind of dream this stuff. But for a client, this is not their business. They're actually writing an application, and actually selling a product, right? Or, or selling a service. So for them, they're not spending that much time actually digging into this, into this kind of intricate detail of what MySQL does. So whenever they need to read the slow query log or see what MySQL is doing, they really need to tune in to what the MySQL server is doing or call me. And both are slightly more expensive than actually having the ability to easily find stuff. Um, so that's the main reason for this, the existence of this kind of log. It makes, it makes, the, it makes the work for remote DBAs and consultants easy, but it also makes the work easier for an individual user, um, even with a lower level of, not necessarily expertise, but a lower level of interest. Um, why make things difficult if you can make it slightly easier without going overboard? Um, <clears throat> one that I find particularly shiny is show, the show user, client, table, and index statistics. Um, these are Google patches, by the way, and the way this is done, so Google essentially has its own branch of MySQL. Uh, it's not quite a fork, it's just for internal use, and um, the issue with that is they do it for their own purposes, and it kind of rolls a heck of a lot of changes into one. You can't actually sanely I think there's one or two people outside Google that do it, but you can't really sanely run the MySQL version with all the Google patches because it modifies so many things that it might indeed uh, hurt kittens when you do um, run it in a world other than the particular Google world that it was designed to do. It is debugged for the Google case. It's not debugged for lots of different types of users. Um, and it's all together. So what people do, and sometimes, um, sometimes um, Google does this themselves, and sometimes other people do this, extract individual features from the Google patches. So you see that list there. I think, yep, my error is visible. Um, those are extracted, extracted patches that, have then, that can then be applied separately. So that means that if there's a bug, we can actually fix it. More people will keep using it. And in some cases, we've already found bugs, and they get fed back to Google. So it helps them as well. And that, in, in turn, encourages them to actually extract patches for us because making that effort allows us to build it for you guys. You guys provide the feedback on what's wrong with it and they make their, st their stuff better. So Google will run better because we actually try the, um, try the additional code. <clears throat> what index statistics does is tell you which indexes on which tables are being used to retrieve how many rows and, and so on. So it provides interesting statistics. But on the fundamental level, it actually tells me which indexes are being used. Now, the version two of that patch can be um, accessed through information schema. 
And that means that I can now do a, a query where you can join the indexes that you have on a table onto this table, do a left join or subquery, and you actually find out which indexes are not being used. And that's gold, because how else do you find out about that? You don't. You can kind of do it by deduction. If you have a table and you see certain queries, you know that some indexes are redundant, some indexes will just never be used because you know a little bit about MySQL and the queries and the data pattern and so on. But this is from the real world. Now you can just, with a single query, just find out every month which indexes are not getting used. That's brilliant. You remove them and your, your in-search updates and deletes become faster. That's nice. And disk I.O. reduction and so on. That is really, really important. That's the only way to do it. Um, otherwise, you'd have to run every query separately through explain work out whether it's using an index and hoping that your data pattern from then from when you really ran it is, is the same as from when you ran it through explain it's it's much more quirky um, so this really needed to go inside the database server and just grab that information out um, now i know the there's the mysql query analyzer which is part of the mysql enterprise offering that's a really cool piece of work but it does sit in between the client and the server it doesn't have this information except again by deduction of, of show, show status or other trickery that it does. Um, this doesn't cost any additional queries, it's just a counter inside the server. Um, so, that's additional, I, I call it instrumentation, things that allow a DBA or a, a developer to actually get some extra information out and see what's going on in either their development system or their production system. There's stuff that um, makes replication easier to use or enables additional use cases. So mirrored bin log is a trick that Google has been using. Um, so who here uses replication? This would be pretty much everybody who uses MySQL, I would think. Yeah, at least, yes, Trent, <laughs> you too. Um, so the issue is if you have a master and a couple of slaves and the master dies, you want to point one slave at another slave. However, the binary log that they keep is not the same. The offsets will be different. And that's a problem because it makes it into a manual process. You can automate part of that, but in the end, you have to manually actually see where you are at. That becomes very annoying. Um, and we have a big deployment like Google that becomes really, really annoying, so they start hacking the server to solve their headache. What they did was the following, and it, it, is, it is a bit of a hack, and it eats disk space and IR. Um, but then again, it's a slave. You had an extra slave if you run out of, out of juice on the machine. It's, it's not expensive. So what they do is the slave maintains next to its relay log an exact copy of the master's binary log. It's just there as well. And it can keep the same name and it will have the same offsets. Like I said, it's a hack. There's probably, there is cleaner ways to do this, but there's also completely different approaches um, which they're now working on. So what it means, though, is that if the master breaks, you can actually point one slave at another slave with the exact same file offset that it was already at, and it will just keep running. And that's fab. And fast master promotion helps with that. It actually allows you to um, temporarily disable, for instance, um, clients connecting from, to the MySQL server, but the root, uh, root user can still connect, admin users can still connect. Um, so you can use that to not shut down the server and actually change some settings and actually reconnect it to another, to another master. So the fast master promotion means that you don't have to restart the server for certain operations. And actually, you have the ability to, to um, prevent new connections as well as actually actively disconnecting um, clients at a particular stage. Um, the reason for that might be that if people are connecting to a slave that needs to be promoted to a master, they're connected to the slave as, and, and know that it's a slave but that slave will become a master and needs to take care of writes, not just reads. So you don't want those slave connections to persist. You actually want the write connections to go there. So you want to kick them off, they reconnect to a real slave, and then they can use the master differently. Um, normally, you can't do that kind of trickery without restarting the server um, or additional scripting. It's now just built in. It's a single command. It's rather nice. Um, kill of idle is, a, is a, like a neat little trick that you might like. Um, sometimes you find um, connections in your process list um, of that, that just sit there doing nothing, sleep, then a high number. The problem is 
that they could suddenly become alive. So if you script killing them, that's a bit dangerous because you could actually be killing a query at that point, and that can upset applications. So what this does is kill if idle. It tells the server to do this, but only if, that, if, if it's idle while the command is being run. So if the particular connection is suddenly active again, it won't actually destroy that connection. So it's a neat trick that some applications need to use. It usually, it's usually applied in cases where the application is somewhat unreliable but can't be fixed. Um, for instance, that there's the old case of, which can be fixed, obviously, um, the case of MySQL um, or PHP being used with persistent connections to the MySQL server. That's a, with Apache, that's hideously inefficient. It uses lots of connections that don't get reused. Um, this is one way of actually cleaning up that kind of stuff, but also it could be hung scripts, things like that. Um, this one is rather nice. Um, inside InnerDB status. Who here has, has played with show InnerDB status? Anyone? Some people? Twin could stick his hand up, I would hope. Yes? Good lad. <laughs> um, anyway, it, it's something you just need to do to track down problems in the InnerDB subsystem. You get a lot of information, but it's kind of a text chunk. Um, the problem is there's some stuff in there that you don't actually want to see. The superfluous information on internal locking structures of um, of InnerDB, I really don't give a stuff most of the time. It's the bugging info. Why didn't we get that switched off somewhere along the way? But it's still in there. On the other hand, you can't get information about row level locks unless you turn on the lock monitor inside InnerDB. The problem is that that also has a couple of other side effects. It, it increases disk I.O. and other things. And you don't want to keep it running all the time. So what Baron Schwartz did a long time ago, he just tweaked the source code a little bit to get rid of the extra information that we didn't want and add in the other information that we do want, but we don't want to have to turn on other specific things that have side effects. Um, so, in a nutshell, showing it to be status is now more useful. Um, Google has been doing more modifications on that to make put a bit more information in it and restructure it a bit so it's more readable. That's a bit more fundamental. I don't know how many tools there are that actually parse this stuff but their restructuring might actually break some of that scripting. So I'm not ready to put that into the R Delta build, but it's interesting to look at. Um, in the buffer pool content, it's kind of a debugging application debugging thing. You actually want to see what's in the buffer pool in terms of indexes and data, and, and you can get performance information from there. The rest of this stuff is, or at least this, yeah, the chunk above, above red. Um, so this is the R Delta sale stuff in a moment and, 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 and is, um, well, some of it there. Um, these are storage engines. I'll deal with those in a moment. So the Yasufumi Kinoshita um, patches mainly deal with performance and mainly deal with InnoDB. So how do you make InnoDB scale properly on CPUs uh, on more than four cores? These threads deal with that. And how do you deal with systems that have more um, more disk I.O. channels, because by default, InnoDB doesn't have more than four I.O. threads. It doesn't matter how you tweak the settings, it still does four I.O. threads. So you can actually tweak them now, and in some cases you can make that dynamic. Um, the problem is, of course, this is an incursion into, into serious server code space. Um, and in this case, it's actually InnoDB, which is not quite MySQL. It's, it's Oracle editing that stuff. So getting these patches into the original code base upstream is a long is a long effort um, for some of these things it's in progress but we need those things fixed now if you have eight cores or 16 core machine you actually need to run a single server for certain cases and um, and have the thing perform rather than degrade on so many cores what do you do well you use these patches um, and you can either build your own server or you can use an R Delta that's the um, that's the trick so storage engines uh, for various reasons of licensing, practicality, business, and so on, um, the original MySQL builds don't include all the storage engines that are out there that might actually be useful. Um, there's the InnoDB, that's for 5.1. There's the InnoDB 5.1 plugin version of the engine, which actually contains additional features over the one that's sitting in the source tree. So what we're doing for our Delta when we get to the, the 5.1 build is actually... Um, essentially wiping the directory that was there, dropping this in during the build process so that it essentially replaces um, 
the original InnoDB with the plugin. What in fact we'll do is we we'll, won't use that version. We're using something called ExtraDB, which Percona has done, which incorporates all these patches already into a complete code base of InnoDB. So essentially they have forked InnoDB on a, on a modest level. Um, Sphinx, who here uses a full text searching? Yep, who here uses Sphinx? I'll, I'll give you a quick one-liner on, on what it does. It's a full-text search system, but you don't have to use it from within MySQL. It actually has APIs from PHP, Perl, Python, Java, whatever, and it is extremely fast. It will actually scale much better than, um, than full-text will, and um, of course full-text is my ISOM only, which is a major downside to it in certain, in certain cases. Um, so with things you don't have that limitation. It, it's not tied to any particular engine. Yes, Monty? Ah, yes? Okay, excellent. I still think Swix is better though, sorry. <laughs> exactly, he's good. But, um, what's that, sorry? Yes, yes, I know, yeah, yeah, yep. That's uh, so what he's doing. Hmm? Um, yep, so it is, it is a, it is a, it's a nice uh, full text engine and you can actually query it from within MySQL so you can actually easily join onto other results. That's of course the, the story, but, in version 5.0, in order to get that engine to work, 5.0 doesn't have the plugins, so you actually need to patch the main server, including the parser, to actually get that stuff in, and then you need to compile the server, uh, the storage engine into the server. It's a bit finicky, it's not difficult to do, but you don't really want to build your own server. So our Delta has done it for you. So any version of our Delta has the Sphinx storage engine built in. If I say, uh, show storage engines, I'll do backslash G again. You can see the magic list. And there's Sphinx. Okay? So you're always guaranteed to have that version, um, to have that, that facility available when you run an R Delta um, build. For 5.1, what we'll do is include those plugins. And yeah, you can say it, it's a, it's a, who here actually uses 5.1? That's not a hopeful. Okay, people who work for Sun don't stick their hand up now. Who actually uses 5.1? <laughs> yes, John. Okay, and up, up there, one. Who uses 5.0? Who uses something else? Yes, what? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're happy, you don't want to upgrade. Is, is there a particular reason you're staying there? And it works for you, so it doesn't matter. It works for you, so it doesn't matter, right? Okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, so. Plugins are fine, but they're very finicky. You need to grab the right plugin for the exact right build of MySQL, otherwise kittens get hurt again. Um, so what we're doing for our Delta is just dropping them in during the build process. Um, it's a bit of a debate going on. We'd like to do it in such a way that it actually is built as a plugin and then enabled at runtime, but that does mean that it, it's an extra step to get to use it. We can drop it in and compile it in, um, and then it's automatically enabled. But that might potentially affect server stability. It could, technically. And we're, we're, with a plugin, if you don't load it, it shouldn't affect it. So there's a bit of a discussion there. Maybe we'll do it one way for the main build and the other way for the uh, our Delta sale build. We'll, we'll see how we go with that. Um, the reason for putting them in in the first place is, yes, they're plugins, but because they're finicky, um, we need to get more people to use, for instance, the PB PBXT storage engine. It has potential. It is a good engine, but more people need to use it. And the only way to get things to, uh, to be used is providing very low threshold for use. If you just have it built into your server, it's very easy to try. If you need to do special builds and compile MySQL yourself, it becomes a hurdle. That's the, that's the story. And PBXT in particular deserves to be out there and tried. Um, Federated X is a special case. The Federated engine inside MySQL at the moment sucks. It contains lots of bugs and everybody knows it. Um, but the person who used to work on there, on that, no longer works at MySQL. Um, and he's fixed most of those problems. And that's the Federated X storage engine. So what we want to do is just drop it in and call it Federated, not Federated X. So it will just be um, an upward compatible or downward compatible um, replacement. So your application will now work without the bugs rather than with the bugs, which is kind of nice. So that's the, um, the feature list in, in short. Um, 
Percona has been very busy over the holidays while I was hanging out in Europe and actually doing lots of new versions of new patches and so on. There's now more stuff there, like in the DB F-Sync and so on. There's lots more um, patches that have, have come across. Um, so they need to be folded into, into our delta. Essentially, Percona for us is one of the upstream providers of um, patches. So we just apply what they, what they do, except they've changed their structure a little bit. They used to not be on Launchpad with Bazaar, and now they are, which is really good. Um, so we need to change the, the structure inside um, our delta a little bit to actually merge that in nicely. Yes? Well, for extra DB, we just grab extra DB. Yes, but that doesn't work for 5.0. Oh, right. Yeah. For inner, for inner DB, yeah, for inner DB for 5.1, yeah, we still have to deal with the real world that runs 5. Look, it's still 4.0, right? So, I, I know, look, th this is, that's another thing that I should actually mention. Look, Drizzle is really shiny pretty, but the real world doesn't run Drizzle. The real world runs MySQL 5.0, not 5.1, not 6. It runs 5.0, and in some cases even 4.0. And those people have needs that need to be addressed. And that's the reason of existence for, for, um, for, for the Delta builds. We need to add those patches in some kind of predictable way um, without making our life too difficult. Of course, as the number of patches increases, the management problem will increase as well. So we will try and be sane. We don't put everything in. We can't. Yes, sorry? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so you're essentially, yeah, if you're using Google Patches now, then our delta is probably a neat migration path because you're not losing anything along the way. So the, the, the current problem we have with 5.1 with um, is a business problem. Percona, of course, allocates their time based on business needs by their customers. Most of the customers run on 5.0. Some of the customers run on 5.1, but they don't need all the patches that they have. So at the moment, we have most Percona patches are on 5.0, and not all of them have been ported to 5.1. Now, if we do a 5.1 build, I would like it to be the case that we don't actually lose any functionality, because otherwise your upgrade will end up being a downgrade. Isn't that a bit of a problem? So we've kind of painted ourselves in the corner by adding stuff into 5.0 that is not yet in 5.1. So if you are a bit of a half hacker, um, help appreciate it. That would be really cool. Um, and how do you do that? You go to Launchpad, and there's the Ardelta project. There's a group called Ardelta Developers, and you can just join that. And we can look at the code. Yes, the check-in times are a bit dismal because there's been holidays, and it's summer holidays in Australia, of course. Um, so those are the trees that are that are currently alive and, and, and public, um, and, and the main trunk. So that's the 44 build that I'm, I'm looking at currently. Um, so you can just branch from there and um, and push a, a new tree back in there, and it will show up here. The recommended way to do that is use your own name on Launchpad, slash our delta, slash, and then our delta dash, whatever you're trying to do. Our delta slash better mousetrap. Yeah? Um, that gives it kind of a predictability, and you can regard them as development, or experimental, whatever you like. Um, and the revisions get tracked there. Um, and people can have a look at that. You can actually propose for merge with the main branch or another branch that you, you worked from. Um, Launchpad is a bit finicky with that kind of stuff, but once you get the hang of it, it actually does everything you need it to do. It doesn't have the most brilliant user interface on the planet, but it works. And that is really, really cool. It tracks the entire development process over multiple branches, and it's all public. You can all browse it. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, so how do we do the patches? We've also gone through a couple of iterations there, but at the moment we're using Quilt. That may change when Bazaar sorts out its... What did it have? Loom. Um, Loom doesn't quite do what Quilt does on the level that our Delta needs, but I've talked with the Bazaar developers, and what they have is very close to what we need with a little bit of trickery. Um, so what does Quilt do? Quilt has a list of patches. Let's see if I can actually pop that up. How much time do I have, by the way, Stu? Minus, like, three minutes or something. 
What's that, sorry? <laughs> now, what, what time am I? Round up, yeah? Wind up, okay. What? So what time am I at? Thank you. Um, okay, I can't show you right now because that is not quite uh, the right development environment. My development environment crashed, um, so I need to actually recover that. My, I have a little disagreement with, um, what is the thing I'm running it in? Um, virtual box. It's very good at destroying its state and stuff at some point. It's a bit sad. But it is free, so what am I complaining about? Um, yeah, so, so Quilt has a list of patches that you can apply as a stack. Um, and it's basically just a wrapper around diff and merge, um, no, diff and, diff and patch, um, with a couple of extra things, but it applies it to an entire tree. Um, so it's just rather useful, and we can actually use it to refresh patches. So in a new version, some lines of code might change. Uh, patch can deal with that, but it's nice to update the source code, obviously, so you don't get all those offset patches. Uh, we can do that, and Quilt does that automatically. It can actually update some extra surrounding information as well there. Um, so we have a, a patch file essentially for MySQL 5.0 and a patch file for 5.1, and so on. So adding a new patch is fairly trivial. You create an actual patch file, you add it in there, and you can actually use Quilt to do that. And you can just say um, Quilt uh, push dash A, and um, that applies all the patches to the current one, and that's what we essentially use to make a build. All the patches are applied. If you want to work on a particular patch, you only apply it to that particular patch. You can change it, and then um, say Quilt Refresh, and it will actually know which files are part of that patch, and just update your patch file, which is a single file. It is really, really cool. Um, it's actually what some of the kernel developers use, and they use it with thousands of patches. We only have a couple of dozen, so I think that it will work. There's a couple of quirks, but overall it works really well. Um, one word of warning about using Bazaar. I found that, at least on the Mac, it breaks on Samba shares. It really doesn't like it. And I've also had this um, from some other operating systems, but that's mainly resolved now. Um, so if you have a shared repository on, on, a, on a system, um, that, gets a bit, um, that gets a bit tricky. So I keep local repositories now in my virtual machines and in, and in Mac and, and all, all that. Um, anyway, so t tomorrow there's the, um, there's the talk about the details of the particular patches, but this gives you a basic overview of what you can do and how you can do it. I'll quickly show you what a download might look like. Oh, by the way, there is documentation for those patches as well. Um, it's not complete yet, but will be. So you can look up what user stats do, and you actually get information of the summary, where the patch comes from, the actual commands, what the output is, um, and there will be examples as well. Um, and it also notifies you if there are incompatible changes compared to, to other versions of things. So if, there, if any keywords, any reserved words are added to the server by a particular patch, we let you know about that. We try to make good documentation of what we actually do. Because, of course, it is tricky, um, patching a production system. So this, this gives you the idea for, for Ubuntu how to install. Um, yes, we're taking some shortcuts here because you shouldn't just install our, um, our GPG key without, um, without verifying and so on, but this is the basic idea, and if you're smarter, you can actually work that to your liking. Um, so the first command, add your GPG key to the, to the key ring that's used by apt-get, and after that you use wget on, um, well, the release version that could be hardy or intrepid or um, uh, and, and so on. Um, that's our delta or that's our delta save. So you can't install both at the same time. Um, and it just has that list and it puts them in a separate directory. Um, then when you do apt get install um, MySQL server or up update MySQL server. Oh, is it update or upgrade? I always forget. Um, anyway, it, it regards our delta as an upgrade to your existing MySQL install. So if you don't want that, be really, really, really careful. It does regard itself as the normal package, and it will generally have a newer version or different naming so that it actually regards itself as an update. Um, so it is pretty much a drop-in replacement. Um, downgraded is a bit more finicky. You'd need to get rid of that and just remove the packages and then reinstall MySQL or just make sure you grab those earlier versions. 
Downgrading actually has a problem, I believe, Peter, wasn't that the issue? Or was it the source package git that broke? There was something that was fundamentally broken in apt git. I think it was the source package. Yeah, you can, we have the source package, you can just browse to it in our download mirrors, but um, it doesn't actually work if you run it through apt git. Things, it talks funny garbage and it's not really our fault. Um, if you do a source package git on some other packages, it, it breaks as well. Um, so the source packages for Debian Red Hat, they are available, as well as a plain um, tarball. So, questions? Everybody's kind of heading for lunch. And no questions? Come on. Um, yes, we hope. Um, in some cases, the modified behavior shouldn't actually change the behavior of the server, so we run it through the standard test suite. And if it doesn't break any kittens there, then it should be okay. Um, it's a bit tricky with those things because in some cases it's extra output. Um, and the test suite doesn't deal with that. For instance, um, this version that I'm currently running actually can crash the server, and I'll tell you where, uh, because it's interesting. Um, if you're running mysql d dash dash help dash dash verbose, it will crash. Because the way I patched the micro slow log to do microseconds pro properly in the configuration that you can do fractions of seconds. In the output, it doesn't quite get it right and it crashes the server. But it's only when you run that particular command so it doesn't actually crash the server on, at runtime. If you just run the server normally, there's absolutely no harm done. But how do you test that? You don't. The test suite doesn't deal with starting up a server and testing whether the output is still, of the startup process is still okay. Um, how do you test that? Or the output into the slow query log? It doesn't test that. So. Yes, um, so the, the honest answer is we'd like you to find out and break it and let us know. This is the proper open source way of doing it, right? <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, uh, at some point you can stare yourself completely blind on, on those things and given that the MySQL test environment is pretty decent at finding some stuff but not fantastic at, at checking the whole array of output everywhere, <coughs> it just checks query results essentially and behavior in some cases by, um, by deriving from that query result. So it's not fantastic at finding this kind of quirky things that we're doing. What do you do? Um, so use it, break it, please. That's why I'm talking here. Um, I'd like more people to break it more often. And uh, that would be great because that makes for better quality code. Um, so we've been a bit quiet over the holidays. Um, and of course there's the 5.1 patch problem. But um, yeah, there will, be, there will be new builds shortly of, of maybe a 5.067, but certainly a 5.075. There should be a 5.1 coming. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, there's still a debate going on whether they're actually put on a 5.1 and put it in a separate um, distro list here again so that it doesn't regard itself as an upgrade to 5.0. You would have to specifically decide to go 5.1 and then you can upgrade. Um, that might be the safe way to go. And in that case, we could do a release with just the Percona patches as they are now, plus some extra Google stuff, rather than having the full patch set available because that will take considerable time and we want to do it. It would be nice to do it incrementally because then we can find problems over time rather than having a big chunk and then sending it out. So that's the story. Trent. What are you saying, sorry? Um, oh, you mean in, in applying patches, patch conflicts? Yes. Five. Yeah, we have, to, we have to be careful with what we do. And there are dependencies inside the patch um, stack. So if you can't apply, if, if you haven't applied this, you can't apply that because it's, or and the other way around, they, they would conflict. The main cause of the problem is the parser. Um, sometimes because internally in the parser, just for practicality, we have things ordered alphabetically. And sometimes things are alphabetically within the three lines of code that it needs for context. We can make it one line of code, but that makes it highly dangerous to patch, so we don't want that. So we'd rather have it break. Um, 5.1 is easier in that respect because you can have plugins that do that kind of stuff without modifying the parser. So 5.1 will actually have fewer patch conflicts than 5.0, even though we're essentially doing the same patches. But not everything is pluggable, so we still need to hack into the um, we still need to hack into the parser. For instance, the kill if 
for the for the, the unused processes and stuff that is still a um, that's still a partial patch because there's no plug-in infrastructure for that particular kind type of thing process list plugins you know, doesn't exist so um, yeah it's not all quite straightforward but it is relatively predictable and so far it's been relatively painless but it's not entirely zero effort you can't just leave that that's the thing you can't just leave out one patch we can't create a pick and choose system it just doesn't work um, Jeremy Cole wanted to do that originally where you select it on the website I want that patch and that patch and that patch build it for me nice and principle doesn't fly now there's one comment to that loom might actually fix this because the way loom regards those patches is all separate and it does what it calls an octopus merge between all of them it doesn't just apply one and then the next and then the next it applies all of them as a merge and that makes it much smarter about the differences and the offsets it doesn't care because in the end, it doesn't matter which order two keywords have in the parser. That's irrelevant to the functionality of the parser. So um, whether it patches it this way or this way, it's OK. So if we get to use Loom, that would make it nicer. So I would like to use it, but at the moment, Quill does most of it. But it is patch-based, and patch is stupid, right? Stupid for functional. OK, last question. Anybody? All righty. Thank you all.